Welcome to The Spiritual Masters, a podcast from Tan Books and Tan Direction, in which we look at the greatest and holiest writers from Catholic history. Join us as we explore the life and times in which they lived, an overview and study of their greatest works, and how we as Catholics can look to these masters as models for our own holiness on our journey to heaven. Welcome back, everybody. We are continuing our series on the spiritual masters, and in this mini-series, we are uh, diving deep into uh, the life and times and work of the great St. Augustine, the uh, the doctor of grace, a church father. Um, and he's he's a saint who I've really come to to love and admire the more I've got to know him, and we're, we're accompanied by my good friend, uh, Dr. Paul Thigpen. So thank you for being back with us today, Paul. Great to be here, Connor. Thank you. We've learned a lot over the last uh, numerous episodes about, let's see, we've covered his life and times. We've covered the uh, the confessions, of course. We touched on the city of God. And last time we, we dove pretty deep into um, the three major heresies that he uh, contended with in his life. So that was a lot of fun. This episode, we're going to focus on really St. Augustine's uh, love and appreciation for Holy Scripture. And I find this particularly interesting that the main document, the main work um, that we're covering is is entitled On Christian Doctrine. And I kind of feel like maybe it's a misnomer because essentially this book is his explanation on how to properly read and interpret scripture. And uh, I find this particularly interesting, Paul, because... Augustine was such a philosopher. He was such a classically trained uh, rhetorician. He was a, a man of the of the world, and uh, we we mention this at the end of the Confessions. He finishes it with the three last chapters or books of the Confessions was on was on Genesis, and I mentioned that I felt that that was a foreshadowing of how the remainder of his life was largely going to be his exploration of the wisdom embedded in scripture. And so whenever he wasn't busy fighting a heresy or doing his canonical duties as a bishop, he was doing commentary on scripture. And so while we're going to talk about his sermons later, which are largely scriptural based, he did take time in 397 and then a little bit more in the year 426. And event eventually we ended up with On Christian Doctrine, which is four parts or four books put together to explain how he, you know, really dove deep into, into scripture. So um, let's just begin first. Let's talk, Paul. Tell us your knowledge of Augustine and, and how you think his training in rhetoric and you know his emphasis, that classical education. How do, how can you see how those tools, those particular skill sets that he learned? Uh, may have helped him in his becoming a great scripture scholar because nothing's by accident. God had him have those secular trainings, and he brought that to bear in his uh, ability to read scripture. Well, he, he was deeply trained in how to uh, present a message. You know, that's what you do in rhetoric, and how to <clears throat> excuse me to persuade and to well to inform as Aristotle would have it to inform persuade and delight. Hmm. And so I think for Augustine, part of what he was going to do in scripture was to ask himself, how is, how is God through this, this word he's writing, doing those things, informing, persuading, and delighting. And the delighting part, I think he would have enjoyed a lot because his, uh, his native North African culture, uh, the preaching and teaching apparently tended toward being witty and vivid and concrete and full of stories and that kind of thing. So <clears throat> I think what's an important to realize is that the uh, the classical background he had um, at the beginning made it harder for him to appreciate Scripture. Yes. <clears throat> and he says that in confess the Confessions, that um, <clears throat> he's used to, to reading philosophical treatises, and instead he, he gets the story about Abraham almost killing his son, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> and Adam and Eve with the fig leaves and that kind of thing. And and it was because of St. Ambrose, largely, that he begins to see how you approach the Scripture, and it's not the way you would approach Plato or Aristotle or someone like that. Yes. And so both he's been trained in how to communicate 
now he's asking himself, okay, how is God communicating to us through his word? This is his, his words, the words of God. And he begins to, uh, to understand it through, uh, he, he talks a lot about signs, <clears throat> that perhaps if we were unfallen, God might have communicated it a different way. But now that we are fallen, then there's certain kind of um, accommodations, you might say, yeah. that God has to make to our fallenness in order to communicate. Yeah. As you would to a child, for instance, <clears throat> um, or to someone who's kind of a slow learner, <laughs> you would say. So you tell stories. So you use, uh, you make analogies and you connect different points. Um, you speak in symbols sometimes, but uh, as the, the general word he uses is signs. You yeah. speak in signs. And so God speaks to us in signs, and that becomes the key to him, for him, to reading and interpreting and also preaching the scripture. You know, uh, in the in the uh, the prologue of On Christian Doctrine, uh, St. Augustine says that the Christian teacher kind of has three tasks, and you are a great teacher of the faith. You have taught in the classroom, through writing, through RCA classes, just every imaginable way. And he says the, the task of the Christian teacher, and this, again, this is in the context of how to read and interpret Scripture. He says they have to first discover truth in Scripture. Second, they teach the truth in Scripture. And third, they defend the truth mm -hmm. in Scripture. And that's the proper progression. Again, you can see this very logical thing, but a beautiful articulation of it. So first, you discover it. Second, you teach it. And then when necessary, you have to know how to defend it. I'm sure you've experienced all three of those in, you know, in your own life. Um, but I want to emphasize one other point he makes in his prologue. In order to do those three things properly, to do any of those, especially all three of them, he emphasizes humility. And he does that because um, even in his day, and we're into, you know, we're in 400 something, in his own day, uh, prideful people were already concluding that they didn't need authority to interpret mm -hmm. the scripture for them. He, they, they were able to read scripture on their own and get all the message from God that they needed a little bit of sola scriptura you know in a way and uh you you you're a convert so you you certainly come from uh, our Protestant brethren in that understanding but this this issue of teaching authority in relation to scripture was present all the way back in Augustine's day comments on that well and and this larger issue of authority he talks about it in the confessions uh, I would talk about it, <clears throat> excuse me, in, in that light in RCA sometime where folks will say, well, can't, sh shouldn't you just be able to reason things out by yourself or you have your own experience? Uh, isn't it a lesser kind of knowledge to accept something on the word of someone else, that, which is what you do with authority? And I would respond the way St. Augustine responded. He said, well, let's see, if you follow that principle throughout your life, how much will you really know? Hmm. <clears throat> let's start off with who are your parents? Oh, well, my parents are Bob and Jane. <laughs> well, how do you know that? They told you that, but you're taking them on their word. It could be, and it actually has been the case of some people that they're, they're not. They've adopted it, but they don't want to tell them. So, for instance, or <clears throat> how do you know that China exists or <laughs> some far distant country? You've never been there yourself. You take it on the word of people who've, who've been there. Because the, <clears throat> the balloons are coming over from there. That's how I know they're there. <laughs> <That's> Sorry. <laughs> that put this show in a time slot <laughs> you, in history. You just us. So yeah, if right. they're listening to this five years from now, they might not have any idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, and, and it's true. If you, I used to have my, my students in my uh, intro religion courses talk about, okay, uh, here's, a, here's a list of things to know or, or that you could know. And I want you to tell me, beside each one, put an R if you know it by reason. Uh, e, if you know it by experience. A, if you know it by authority. Wow. And, what a great exercise. And I would even do things like um, the temperature outside. And they say, okay, I look at the thermometer, blah, blah, blah. So experience, no, you're trusting what temperature it is on the authority of the person who made that, that they actually did it correct and that they're wow. telling you that. If you really take it to the extreme, and, and he, he makes this point, you hardly know anything if you wouldn't accept anything except what yeah. you experienced or what you could figure out by reason. Yeah. And so with scripture, that's, that's so important then, that we need the authority of the church to understand. That's wonderful. And, you know, <clears throat> he talks about in this prologue on Christian doctrine that God made us with other men. We're communal by nature, just like the Trinity is. We have to rely on other people. That's only reasonable. Like, so 
he's, I think he's addressing people who think I can just take my reason to scripture. And he's saying, on the contrary, reason makes you take other people as authority, not, you know, so, mm-hmm. so that's the rational thing to do because we learn from others in every aspect of our life, whether China exists, just like you're saying. So well, he even, he even said, you know, the, well, the reason I came to the, the scripture was because of the church. And the reason I came to the church was that reason led me to the place of accepting the church's authority. Mm. And so it's uh, reason started him off getting to the place where, yes, I, you know, I accept the church's teaching. It, it, it makes sense of so much anyway, and so many other things. And now that I have the authority, then that helps me to, to get the further understanding. Mm. So it's, it's faith-seeking understanding, but even to get to the faith, there's kind of a way in which knowledge helps you. I'll, I'll tell people, they say, you, you accept what the church says, that's blind faith. And say, no, actually, I was an atheist. It was reason that got me to the place of even believing in Christ. And then it was further reason that led me up to the gates of the Catholic Church. So the fact that I have faith in what the church teaches me authoritatively is not blind. Mm. I've been a whole lifelong journey that got me to that place. Mm. And he was saying, I think it's the same thing. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> just kind of marching through the book a little bit. Um, he, I just want to mention, this is interesting, in book one, after the prologue, in book one, he has this interesting little thing. He talks about use versus enjoyment. And he talks about how there's a lot of things for our use, for the use of our salvation, even other people. And I'm not, this is not meant that they're not ends in themselves. It's not really a conversation about that. But other people, other things, job, money, you know, wife, kids, whatever it is, all of these are gifts from God that are useful for my salvation, for working out my salvation. But for God, we should have pure enjoyment in him. God is not useful for anything else. Yeah. Yeah. Even my wife is, you know, she is useful for helping me get to heaven. And having but, children. And having children. But <laughs> yes. I mean, and she did that a lot. She was very helpful with that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so but but God God is not useful for anything. He's the end. Mm-hmm. He's just the end. And so you he talks about how you just place perfect enjoyment in him. And I, it's an interesting thing. Again, it's book one of this entire work on scripture. So he's, you know, I think, and I'm kind of stuck on this idea we've been talking about a lot. I think he's seeing his scripture studies as the apex. It's like the, mm-hmm. it's the, it's the complete part of his, of his studying. He reaches final enjoyment in learning about the Lord in scripture, not in all the other stuff. He, he makes me want to go back and read scripture as opposed to everything else about scripture. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah. but moving on, well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, any just any, any say, comments on that? Yeah, beautifully yeah. that when you say joy, that uh, that's very important to me, his notion of joy, because in reading Augustine, that led to the first book I wrote for adults was called The Reason for Joy. Mm. And the thesis of the book, the argument basically was, if you go looking, the, the, first of all, joy is different from happiness, but if you go looking for joy, you won't find it. You have to go looking for the one who is joy to know. Mm-hmm. And and he would talk about the what you might call the order of delight, or the order of joy. The first you have to perceive the good, and then you know the good. This is platonic. Know the good. And then you love the good for what it is. And then in loving the good, you have joy. You have mm-hmm. delight. Mm-hmm. And you see that in the confessions. You know, he's searching for it, he's searching for it. And finally he starts to see. Finally, he starts to see. And then in seeing, he knows more about God. And then in knowing God, he learns to love God passionately. And in loving God, there's delight in this life. There's joy. And you see it all through the confessions, but you see it in other places like yeah. this too. Yeah, that's beautiful. Book two, just kind of marching through. <laughs> he addresses here, after he's talked about delight and enjoyment and loving God just for himself, we get to book two and he says, Scriptures are obscure. And he, you know, he's used to reading very logical text, you know, and everything, but they are obscure. And he says, he thinks that they're obscure because we're fallen. And so God had to provide us with kind of obscure text to kind of incite us to continue to dig and to understand. And he says here that memory is critical as we have to like internalize scripture. But let's talk about that. Why do you think uh, the the Lord could have written a much more clean and simple book for us? He (laughs) definitely could have. Likewise, Paul, Christ could have given the apostles a very straight A plus B equals C 
kind of catechism, and he did not. He spoke in parables. So there's a consistency here. Again, God using signs in Scripture, Jesus using signs in the New Testament in his life. Talk to us about that. Why does God do that to his children? Well, I think, gosh, several reasons. One, uh, because it's who we are. <laughs> we have, we're incarnate beings. You know, we, we have embodied beings. And um, and so much of what we, how we think and stuff is in stories and analogies and visual imagery and that kind of thing. So it's part of his accommodation to us in that way. But also because uh, parables of those things are what we call multivalent. They have several levels of meaning. And the church has long taught this, that in the scripture, you've got several different layers of meaning, or at least possible meaning, even in the same text. And so it's a very rich, textured way of conveying more than one truth at a time. Mm -hmm. that it means you have to, to dive into it. But um, <clears throat> the other thing, and, and Augustine was, was really clear about this, was in the matter of humility. And he said that, I think he was the one who said the scriptures... Um, in some ways, is uh, so shallow, so shallow, not shallow in a bad way, but you know the water's low enough <clears throat> that even little creatures can go and bathe. But it's also deep enough that an elephant can drown. So, you know, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, and, that sounds like him. <clears throat> and he says that um, that it teaches us humility. Um, he said, "Why are there uh, really obscure passages that maybe none of us have ever even figured out for sure?" And he says to teach us humility that we, there are things, mysteries about God that we cannot figure out. And the proper lesson from that is not, what does this text mean? But the proper lesson is, I don't know it all. Mm -hmm. On that note, Paul, in, in book two, he gives us uh, seven steps <coughs> to wisdom in interpreting Scripture. He lists them out. And I'm just going to mention a few of them here. He says fear of God. You have to have fear of God to find the wisdom mm -hmm. in Scripture. So that means those arrogant academics you know, <laughs> are, are going are gonna to hit a wall. They're going to hit a wall and not see it. He says, purity of heart. Mm -hmm. You have to have purity of heart to really be able to see uh, what uh, is God's message in the scripture. He says you have to have holiness and faith. So all of these things lead to wisdom. And again, this is a former academic guy talking, but he sees you have to bring a certain spirit mm -hmm. to reading scripture. You know, you've counseled countless people. You're a man who has fear of God. You, you're a man of purity of heart. Talk to us about how the, how a person's own personal spiritual situation affects how they read Scripture. Oh, goodness, in so many ways. So we mentioned humility. That's the first thing it does. You don't come in thinking, number one, you know it all already. Number two, that you're even going to be able to figure it all out. Number three, that... Your way is the only way, and so everybody else has to understand it completely the way you do. <clears throat> Second, um, love. That if, as St. Jerome you know, said, that um, ignorance of Scripture is ignorance of Christ, mm. that your love for Christ will bring you to this book and dispose you rightly for receiving what it has to say. <clears throat> if you don't love God, and you're reading the book, and you get to a passage that says, don't do X, <laughs> and you like to do X, how are you going to respond? Mm -hmm. Nah, you're just trying to put that on. I'll, I'll, I'll skip over that and go to the next page. But if you love him, then that, that disposition sets you up to say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. And then, um, <clears throat> so love, humility, um, patience. We have to have the virtue of patience because so many passages are not clear right away. We have to have faith because there'll be things that are hard to believe. And um, contrary to some, maybe what our experience tells us, but faith allows us to say, yes, Lord, I, I believe, help my unbelief. Yes. Purity of heart <clears throat> that he mentioned is, is so beautiful. The, the, the notion of purity in the New Testament we, we tend to think right away of, of sexual purity. It's just chastity. <clears throat> but the word pure in, in the Greek there is pure in the sense of unadulterated, only one thing. Yes. So when we say on a carton, 100% pure orange juice, 
they're not saying there's no dirt in here because <laughs> everybody knows they're not going to have dirt and debris, but it means that it has not been mixed with water or anything else. <clears throat> so purity of heart then, blessed are those who are pure in heart, for they will see God. Purity of heart is that you desire one thing. Your heart is your will. Purity of heart is to desire one thing, a uh, Protestant theologian once said, Kierkegaard. And um, <clears throat> if you're pure of heart and coming to it, then you will see God in the scripture. You will, Because, in part, if you're focused on God, and that's the one thing you want, then all the other things that might be distractions will fade away. So you really focus on something, your peripheral vision kind of fades out because that's what you want. Yeah, that's awesome. And I've... I've been studying that notion of the purity of heart. I, I give talks on the Beatitudes. I just gave one at Legatus in Philadelphia the other day, and we talked specifically about that purity of heart. And it's not chastity. It's something so much more than that. Mm -hmm. And even our notion of our word for adultery comes from like you're contaminating a marriage mm -hmm. with adultery because you've introduced another substance. You know, So it's kind of a fascinating idea, but here's a man of the flesh, Augustine, who is seeing if he really wants to understand Scripture he has to, you know, uh, embody these different traits. And uh, I, I just think it's beautiful. And uh, just to continue on, shortly after that in book three, he says almost exactly what you just said and talking about if you really search the scripture in love, okay, you're going to gain so much more from it than any historical or literary accuracy mm -hmm. you can get. I was having dinner one time with a small group of people and Dr. Scott Hahn. And since then, we've kind of become friendly and we talk every now and then. And we've done some work together in our publishing companies. But I forget I forget what the context of the conversation was. But I said, uh, Dr. Hahn, I'm certainly not a scripture scholar, but here's my take on, on this passage. And he just kind of stopped me. He's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I, he said, I really don't have interest in what scripture scholars have to say. <laughs> That's just scholarship. I, I, I care what real people have to say about about Scripture. He says people always apologize for not being a Scripture scholar. And he's like, but that's not what – scholarship is a totally different thing. I want to know what Scripture means means to you in your life. He's a very humble man. Yes, he is. And uh, yeah. I, was, uh, I was really taken back because he meant it sincerely. It wasn't just lip service, you know, to be polite to – you know, a little guy like me, but it was it was awesome. But again, it's that spirit of Augustine. Augustine is saying the same thing here. And just kind of going through his book four, he goes through and he gives very he gives a crash course on rhetoric and he talks about how uh, rhetoric can be used to teach the faith with eloquence. And he mm -hmm. believes the faith deserves that. Mm -hmm. Um and he, of course, you know, did that to a great extent. But to wrap this up, to kind of bring it to conclusion. He kind of drops the mic at the end, okay? He just brings it home. And again, this was all about how to be a good scripture scholar. And he says that the preacher's life, the, the priest's life, the bishop's life, is far more important than any rhetoric or eloquence that they have. And I think, you know, again, this is in the context of on Christian doctrine, on how to read scripture, how to teach scripture, how to defend scripture. And he's saying, it's really your life that does yeah. that, yeah. not your studies, not your eloquence. Um, and he brings it, the very last thing he talks about, he ends everything with yet again on that humility. If you humbly approach Scripture and you humbly teach it, um, then you're going to make a whole lot more headway than all those academics. But I just love that that last point of if you want to teach your flock Scripture, you actually do it by your example versus your eloquence. And this is like the most eloquent man to ever walk the earth. So I, again, what Augustine is saying about scripture, how to read it, how to teach it, how to defend it, it's showing us the internal, his interior life and what he's trying to do. Any last thoughts on that? I've, I've heard it said before that, uh, you know, watch what, what you are and what you do because you may be the only Bible some people ever read. Oh, yeah. You just nailed it. Yeah, that's it. That's what he was saying. You yep. just you just summarized on Christian doctrine in a sentence. <laughs> that was, well, that was not it. original to me, but yeah. yeah. Say that again. You, you may be the only Bible that some people will ever read. That's beautiful. Yeah. All right, Paul. Thanks so much for being here. Next time we're going to talk about on the Trinity and see how the great St. Augustine largely shaped 
uh, the way in which we discuss the Trinity. So until next time, thank you. Thank you, Connor. God bless you. This has been an episode of The Spiritual Masters, a podcast brought to you by TAN. To follow the show, learn about more inspiring holy men and women, and to support The Spiritual Masters and other great free content from TAN, visit spiritualmasterspodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code MASTERS25 to get 25% off your next order, including works by St. Augustine and countless more spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. And thanks for listening.